As I get ready, I reflect on the magnitude of the moment. Ready to roll. This therapy could have huge implications, not only for me, but for all of humanity. Will it help me break that 120 year ceiling? We'll see. Until now, my team and I have avoided gene therapy because it seemed too risky. If a therapy caused, say, cancer in my body, there'd be nothing I could do to reverse the process. What makes mini circles therapy different is that it has a built-in kill switch. If my body reacts badly, I can take the antibiotic tetracycline, instantly killing and deactivating the DNA molecules I've been injected with. Tell me a bit more about this platform. So, as I stated earlier, the platform is a circular bit of DNA, plasmid. Over the decades, there's been several attempts to make plasmids functional. For example, if you take a regular plasmid, such as PUC19, you code it up to be a mammalian vector. So you have mammalian promoter, mammalian transgene, all the stops. You'll still only get about maybe one to two days of expression if you're lucky. And this is because of transgene silencing. Now it can occur for a wide variety of reasons, uh, both sequentially and as well as what the actual protein you're actually using in some cases. You know, is it a bacterial origin? Is it something that is homologous to the animal or individual you're already testing on? But essentially what we've done is we've mitigated some of those sequences through a variety of little techniques where we've actually gone in and engineered intronic regions and other components that help the actual uh, expression uh, last for much longer because you don't end up having that transgene silencing take place. So we've worked very hard to mitigate that as much as we can. And the benefit of this is we can actually induce transgene silencing. So in the same way that a plasmid would express for maybe one or two days under a standard regime, we actually on some of our vector systems have a kill switch. This kill switch is typically uh, induced by an outside small molecule, uh, namely things such as potentially cumate or tetracycline. So you can administer either this into a, let's say I have a petri dish of cells, I can administer that dosage in and I can watch uh, whatever transgene I'm looking for to stop the expression of. So uh, one uh, example that stands out in my mind is we've done a lot of work with GFP, you know, the standard glowy glowy. And GFP, could you? Oh, GFP is green fluorescent protein. Um, we particularly like it uh, because it's a, uh, you can take an optical measurement. You can literally see it glow. So for us, it becomes an inexpensive way instead of having to chase down an invisible protein, we can actually just have the protein quite easily visible to us. So when we're doing a lot of these in vitro experiments where we're actually testing out vector designs, et cetera, what we've done is we've typically gone with GFP or a similar protein that expresses light. That way we can actually test very cheaply, quickly, a bunch of different iterations without having to resort to Western blots or ELISAs to confirm that the protein has stopped expression or not. Tell me a bit more about this kill switch. How does it work? So the kill switch, as I said before, are you familiar with the intron and extron? Tell me. So basically, the best example I can give is, you know how like uh, the, my skin cells and my brain cells have the same genetic code, you know? Um, part of the reason they express different things is due to a wide variety of factors such as methylation, but also on top of that, some of that code isn't actually used. You know, this is called intronic, so it's inside the genetic code. It doesn't come out, um, even though it can code. So it's got sequences that would be a protein, but for whatever reason, it's not gonna code. And then you have extrons, which are uh, se uh, sequences which actually do express and do code. So in that way, we've actually been able to go in and engineer varying flanking regions, so on the sides of a particular transgene or on the sides of the intron. And we've actually been able to go in and code up those introns and extrons regions and essentially almost make like a circuit or a, a, an ability to respond to it. So let's say, um, you know, we have operators essentially on that that allow it to be coded and allow it to be seen by your internal genetic, uh, you know, machinery under the event that we want it to be like, hey, look at this sequence right here. Hey, that's in, of course, your internal cellular machinery is going to look at that sequence and be like, hey, I don't want that coding, whatever that is. So we can actually not only have those bacterial bits in there and be hidden, we can actually have them pop up and show in order for the transgene silencing to occur. Does that make any sense? What evidence do you have that this kill switch works? As I said before, so when we were doing a lot of this iteration, we went uh, back to the lab bench, as it were. So um, one of the things I really like is using uh, human cell lines. And I love culturing in vitro uh, human cells. 
So I like being able to have a system that is very analogous to humans, while at the same time, I can have multiple iterations. And as I was saying before with the GFP, I know that human cells, I don't know if you know this, they don't typically glow under blue light. So that's a really good indication that I've done something and put in a transgene that wasn't there before that is there now. And so I can take and I can look at those cells and I can uh, dope in the particular kill switch, the actual uh, chemical uh, that would essentially make those components visible and induce transgene silencing. And I can watch those cells go from a nice, eerie, kind of green color, glowing in the dark, to nominal state. So back to not expressing that GFP. Outside of the model of the green fluorescent protein uh, in vitro, do you have in vivo validation of this? We're concluding currently a uh, trial where we've given people the folostatin, we've given them the, uh, the vector, um, and we've seen the expression in their blood, and then we've administered the kill switch to them. And we've, we've seen a drop in the level of expression based on the ELISAs. So sandwich types ELISAs is a type of amino assays. It works based on antibodies. And we can use that system to particularly identify what the concentration is of folostatin or any other transgene. So we've actually been able to take humans, we've been able to administer the therapy to it, then we've been able to uh, have those volunteers take a kill switch, then we've had those volunteers run another, uh, we've run another ELISA on them, and we've been able to see the levels in their blood drop. Now we've not only done that, we've also continued follow-up with those individuals for three months, looking at their blood to make sure it doesn't just rise back up or something other you know, weird happens. So we've seen the drop, we've seen it maintain that drop. And the level at which maintains, is that equal to, to the level that it was before the folostatin therapy? Yes. Do you have a way to titrate the amount of folostatin that the therapy produces? In terms of determining the concentration uh, per dose of the therapy? Yes. So individuals will express variable amounts. Um, this is something we're still trying to determine an exact, uh, you know, per microgram of, uh, you know, vector system to nanogram per milliliter of full statin expressed. There does appear to be some variance within individuals. We have not been able to fully parse it out uh, conclusively yet. Um, typically though, um, we are able to establish a logistics curve of, at a, on an individual level, of how much, you know, a particular amount of therapy should express in an individual. But outside the individual, it's difficult to titrate as of yet, and certain factors seem to be relatively unknown, you know, such as what's the concentration of your myostatin receptors? What's the concentration of actinin? All of these components do play a end result on the actual concentration of the full statin at the end of the day in one's serum level. Due to its short half-life being only approximately 90 minutes, you have to have a constant production of, and supply of it. It doesn't stick around for a long time. So these factors that are taking away from the folostatin in your circulatory system will also affect how much we actually see at the end of the day in the transgene. Are you worried at all about uh, increase uh, upregulation of myostatin receptors in muscle cells? At current, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen upregulation in terms of, uh, particularly in uh, mice. Um, it's uh, something I think we're very cognizant of. It's something I think we are pursuing particularly with future talk studies to make sure we have no upregulation and if there is, to what extent, which would indicate, you know, to us how many years it would appear that a person can be on or off the therapy.